Uh, that said, we are in Matthew chapter 18 this morning. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 18. Once again, to keep the continuity, I don't always do this, but to keep the continuity uh, between these passages here um, of this important discourse, we will read from verse 1 through verse 14. Now, our, fo our focus today will be uh, verses 10 through 14. I trust you read them again. For our visitors, let me say that we did the first part of this message last Lord's Day. And I would say to any of our own people who were not here, um, and uh, I can encourage those of you that are visitors to, uh, to get the, either the MP3 or the, the DVD from last week. And uh, once you hear that through, what I will say today will make more sense. But I trust that there will be a summary enough here that will uh, bring you into the context. Today is going to be about uh, three quarters um, application. So we want to take that important passage and apply it to our souls today. That being said, let's stand together to read this precious word of God. How we thank our God for giving us his word, brethren, his word his inspired, his infallible, his unchanging word. Chapter 18 of Matthew's Gospel, verse 1. Let us hear God's word. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as a little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. For the Son of Man is come to save that which is, was lost. How think ye? If a man have an hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so is not the will of your Father which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. Amen. Amen. May the Lord add the, His wonderful blessing to the reading of His Word. Before we go to prayer, let me say, I know the swans are at home sick and they're watching. I wasn't giving your pew away. <clears throat> oh, brethren, we have many that are still sick. 
Uh, we want to remember the King family this morning and the Swans and uh, Jacob and Jessica Kelly. They're down with colds. Uh, this sickness continues in our midst, so let's pray that God would have mercy. And let us pray for those who could not be with us for other reasons this morning. We're delighted that the Lord has answered our prayers and brought Brother Bill Milrick back to us. Oh, we have a God who hears our prayers. Let's offer them up now. If you can remain standing a few more minutes, we will pray. If it's difficult for you to stand, you may be seated. <clears throat> O holy and righteous Father, our gracious God, our sovereign Lord, almighty creator, our great redeemer, how we praise thee this morning. Blessed be thy holy name, Lord. We praise thee we magnify thee in thy glory. We honor thee as the one true and living God. We love thee, for thou hast first loved us. And we thank thee for all the blessings that we have this very day in Jesus Christ our Lord. O oh, blessed God, what great kindness thou dost show us daily. I praise thee. I bless thee. Father, I could not stand here. Thy precious sheep would not gather here were it not for amazing grace, amazing love. We thank thee that in thy love for us, thou didst give thy holy son to die on Calvary's cross, to rise again the third day, who ascended up into glory, who intercedes for us now, and who will return for us, consummating the glories of his kingdom. Oh, We long for, we yearn, O Christ, for thy return. We yearn for that blessed hope, the glorious appearance of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and to purify for himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. O oh, make us that people today. May there be a holy zeal burning in our souls for what is right, for what is good, for what is pure, for what is lawful, for what brings glory and honor unto thee and what does good to thy people and even to the lost. O oh, Father, now we come to thy word this morning. I cannot handle it. I cannot speak it. Without thy help, Father, I feel like Moses. I cannot speak, slow of tongue. But, O oh God, I look to thee and I pray. And no matter how weak the vessel or the delivery is, bring the mighty power of thy spirit with thy word and move in the hearts of thy people. We do pray for our precious brethren that are sick today. We pray for the kings. We pray for the swans, for their children, Lord. Father, please turn away this season of sickness. Do not let it rifle through the entire congregation again. We pray for the Kellys. That thou wouldst heal them. And for any of our dear brethren, that uh, are afflicted. Father, we pray for our precious brother turning bare. Have mercy on him, Lord. We, thank, we are thankful that once again it appears thou hast brought him to the edge of death and he's looked into the abyss, but he's getting better. We pray, O oh Lord, that thou wouldst raise him up and use him in thy kingdom. 
Father, so many for whom to pray. We do pray for the Haynes family this morning and we ask thee to have mercy on Aaron. Restore him, O oh God, to his right mind. Have mercy, O oh God of mercy. Father, should there be any of thy dear children here this morning wrestling hard with sin, grant them grace and strength. Help them to mortify. Help them to harbor no secret sin. Oh, we plead with thee, Lord, expose secret sin in this congregation. And Father, help us to understand the biblical witness to the horror, the uncleanness, the defiling nature of sin in its every mode, in its every expression. Help us to hate it. Help us to mortify it. Help us never to be its slave ever again. And Father, there are those who are slaves to their sin this morning. We pray that in the mighty power of Christ, Thou would set them free. Save the lost, please. Now, Father, we commend ourselves to Thee and to Thy grace, and we ask Thee, to visit us with thy mighty power this morning, to thy great glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. In this fourth major discourse, our Lord Jesus Christ instructs His disciples about the relationships between the members of God's kingdom. We learned in chapter 12, verses 49 and 50, that the Lord stretched forth His hand toward His disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. This is how view, uh, Christ views his disciples. So we might think of this chapter as a discourse on how the royal family treats each other. In verses 1 through 4, Jesus began with a fundamental principle. Greatness in God's kingdom comes only by humility. Greatness in God's kingdom comes only and ever by humility. And we don't come into the world with it. Setting a young boy amid his disputing disciples, Jesus said, Except ye be converted and become as this little chi child, or become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Following this in verses 5 through 9, our Savior solemnly warned his disciples not to cause any of God's children to fall into sin. Whoso, who's, whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. And then in verses 10 through 14, our passage our beloved Savior issued a stern command. 
Take heed that ye despise not one of these little children, one of these little ones, one little believer. He is not talking about physical children, but believers who have repented of their sins and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, are we not born again to enter the kingdom? Are we not little children and are we not admonished to grow into mature Men, full in the stature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ has said, don't cause my little ones to stumble and do not. That's as plain as language can make it. Do not despise them. Jesus gave two powerful reasons for not looking down on his disciples or treating them with contempt. His little children are so special to God that one, the mighty angels that minister or that stand in his majestic holy presence minister to them. And two, the Son of Man came into this world to save them. God's only begotten Son, the eternal Son, the second person of the Holy Trinity, became a man and came into this world seeking them out and accomplishing everything infinitely necessary to save and keep them for all eternity. How much does God love them? You look to that fact and then you realize... If he loves them so, I must be certain that I do not despise them. Such a mighty love of God for his little children, for these sinful vessels. To further illustrate God's care and concern for each of his children, each Of his children. Jesus gave a parable about a man who owned a hundred sheep. One of them went astray. And the man went into the mountains to find it. And Jesus said that if the man indeed found it. He rejoiced over that sheep. More than the ninety nine that went astray. Or that did not go astray. This parable reveals God's unchanging, seeking, and restoring love for even one sheep that strays from him. Jesus concluded with a heart encouraging and faith building application of his parable. Our Father in heaven is not willing. The almighty will that governs the heaven and the earth is not willing that one of his little sheep should perish. Not the weakest, not the lowest, not one of them. Following the exposition of these verses, which we considered last Lord's Day. We mentioned two applications that arise from this text. By God's grace, we will now expand and contemplate this rich and vital lesson from Christ with a few more uh, applications, as you can see. So our message is entitled, Do not despise God's children. This is part two. And may our loving Heavenly Father give us much help. Much help. 
by filling us with the spirit of understanding so that we might know, love, and obey Christ Jesus with a burning heart and a fervent spirit. Well, let's take up our applications. Having considered an uh, uh, the exegesis, the exposition of these five verses, how do we live these things out practically? Brethren, I had to work a great deal to cut it down to what I've got it. This is as practical a command from Christ as we have. And yet, I fear many of us don't take it seriously. Do not despise my children, says God. So may He grant us much grace. as we consider just a very few applications of this expansive passage. Its implications are immense. So number one, if God so loves His children, if God so loves every one of His children, let us never despise them. You say, well, that's pretty simple, really. That comes right out of the text. How seriously do you take this? When you've got a problem with somebody that professes to be a Christian, when you looked at them and you thought about what doctrine they were talking about or they were talking uh, about some application of life that you don't agree with, were you thinking, now this is God's child. I want to be careful before I wade in. I want to be careful and I want to be cautious. I want to be wise. I want to be discerning. But do I think about these people as God's people? I'm not talking about those that are obviously lost. I'm talking about those who profess to know the Lord. <coughs> Shall we despise what? God loves. You need to answer that question. So do I. Shall we despise what God loves? If the God who is love so cherishes and cares for the very least, the lowest, weakest and vulnerable of his children. How dare we look upon them as nothing? You might say, well, you know, we, well, we have to know who God's children are. Do you? How sure are you? When was the last time you could see the Holy Spirit in somebody's heart? Now, I can tell right now, there are going to be some sitting right in here going, mm-hmm, he's moving toward compromise. And I say, back up and listen to Christ. Don't despise my little ones. Brethren, having considered the words of our passage, is it not clear? I'm pressing you. I'm pressing myself. Is it not clear from Christ's command, His reasons, His parable, and His declaration of God's preservation that the Father loves them? He loves His disciples he loves his little children with an infinitely holy love. 
a people for whom God sends His angels as ministers are not to be despised as worthless. A people for whom God sent His darling Son into this world are not to be viewed with contempt. And one of the great tragedies to this is some of us may say, yeah, I agree with that. And then we use our own standard by which to determine who is and who is not a Christian. This is dangerous ground because of the command in front of us. This is why the Lord Jesus Christ began with, there's no greatness in my kingdom without humility. You will not rise high without going very low, ever. Let us then ask, what are some of the ways that we can despise God's children? I had to hold it at the number we presently have, but I had more before I came this morning. Number one, we may despise God's children because they do not agree with us. We may despise, look down on, look at with contempt because they don't agree with us. This is one of the most obvious reasons Christ's disciples may look down with contempt on one another. We will therefore give most of our time to this issue. It's not a mistake. The vast majority of our time this morning will be just on this one point. And then we'll move on to the others and move through them more quickly. But this is important. And let me say to you, brethren, I'm not going to say this perfectly. And if you've got lots of catchphrases and buzzwords, I might miss them all this morning. But that will not change anything that I'm saying. You may want me to scratch your itch this morning, and it may not be me to do that. But Jesus Christ has commanded us not to despise his children. And one of the ways we do that the most quickly is when people do not agree with us. I am not saying that all error or any error is okay. Let's get that out of the way. I'm not saying, well, you got to go along to get along. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying, well, we just have to agree to disagree. Is everybody clear about that? So let's get that out of the way, get the filters gone, and let's hear what we need to do here. Number one. As we consider the following, we must be very cautious and humble. These are active things that we must do. Let us hear the words of Jesus. Take heed, therefore, how ye hear. And I give you his words this morning. Listen with caution. Listen carefully. Listen with discernment. Same thing from James. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Now most of us violate this command of Scripture regularly. While somebody's talking, we've already got our argument going and all our filters are jumping up so that we can disagree with them and tell them they're wrong. And that's foolish. Be quick to hear. Zip it and make sure you've understood what's being said to you. Then respond. So listen very carefully. Number two, it is true that some doctrines of Scripture and some aspects of the Christian life are non-negotiable. I'll repeat that. It is true. There are some doctrines of Scripture and some aspects of the Christian life that are non-negotiable. You cannot be wrong about them and right 
about being one of God's little children. Now, if you're one of those who has a 180 mind, we've got a few here. It's like pastor says something and you immediately go to the 180 and go, but what? And it's like, just hold on. All of God's truth is important. Every bit of it, violating any of it, is not right. Is that clear? Did anybody hear me say, it's okay to violate God's scripture at any point? Anybody hear that this morning? It's not what I'm saying. Okay. But there are some doctrines in the scripture that you simply cannot be wrong about. And there are some doctrines that God's people can be in error about and have been in error about and are still God's people. Did I just say that's okay? No! I said that is the way it is and it's clear from the epistles of the New Testament. It's clear from the teaching of our Lord that such is the case. The difficulty we have is where to draw the lines. And we all have that problem. We all have that problem. Some of us put the boundaries too far out. And some of us put the boundaries too far in. That is the human condition. Well, How do we balance that with what Christ has said? Don't despise his children. And then to the best of your ability, love them where and how you can. And I, that's, I admit, sometimes it's exceptionally difficult. There are fixed and absolute doctrines that simply cannot be violated without us proving to be unregenerate souls. A Jehovah's Witness may know his Bible better than you, and the tragic part about it is that many of them do. But they're lost because they've got the wrong Jesus. Jesus warned that there would be false Christs, and they hawk one of them. And there are many others, including some of the ones that so-called evangelicals preach. I trust that this is clear to you. For example, we cannot reject the doctrine of the inspired, infallible scriptures, for this is to deny the revelation of God, our Creator and Redeemer. We cannot reject the doctrine of the Trinity, for this is to deny the God revealed in Scripture, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one true and living sovereign of the universe. We cannot reject the full deity and full manhood of Christ, for this is to deny the one mediator between God and man. We cannot reject the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross, for this is to deny His saving work, the pardon of sin, and the hope of everlasting life. We cannot reject justification by faith alone, for this is to deny the perfect righteousness that Christ accomplished for His people and to introduce man's works righteousness into the doctrine of salvation, thus destroying the gospel of God's grace. We cannot reject that believers must pursue a life of biblically defined holiness for this is to deny God's purpose for our lives in this world and for preparing us for the world to come justification God declaring us righteous and sanctification God making us righteous are distinct but inseparable things. Yeah. 
Now, I could go on a lot longer with this, but I trust at least these give you some examples, vital examples of things that are non-negotiable. But we must consider, having said this, when sinners are converted, now listen carefully to me, when sinners are converted, they rarely have any knowledge of the doctrines we've just considered. Or at least, not much. When you're born, you don't know much. But you begin to grow. And it's in that growth where we begin to see whether there's real conversion or not. Whether you are teachable. Whether you are submitting to the Word of God. Whether the aspects of your life, as you begin to understand your life more and more, when God drops off the blinders of your being lost and a slave to Satan, and you begin to see and understand life, you want to walk with God. You want to walk with Christ. You want to know whatever this book says. You want to know that when the Lord says it, you want to do it. At least when, until you understand it. And even pastors still scratch their heads and say, you know, I'm not sure about this. But I'm praying. I'm looking. So, there are undeniable, non-negotiable doctrines. And when we're born of God's Spirit, we don't know much about them. But we grow to them. By God's grace, we grow into them. Now, <clears throat> when we go next to number three, we want to continue our careful listening. Not all God's people will come to the same understanding of what holiness of life includes. They'll be ignorant of some things. Brethren, when you go into some of these countries where they might have a page of the Bible instead of these nice leather-bound Bibles that we have, they don't know much. But they're alive in Christ. And one of the ways you know is when they hear the Word of God, they want to walk in it. They're delighted for it. But not all of God's people will come to the same understanding of what holiness of life includes. All of Christ's disciples are always learning. That's what being a disciple means. You are a learner from Christ. None of you here and not one breathing soul on this planet is going to reach the 100% mark in this life. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't live and strive toward it. If the Spirit of God dwells within you, that's precisely what you want. I repeat, all of Christ's disciples are always learning doctrinally and practically I need Christ's doctrine I need to know how to live according to it and we have seen throughout Matthew's gospel that Jesus' hand-picked disciples understood little of what he said even Peter the rock unwittingly denied Christ's coming redemptive work on the cross and the resurrection, God's eternal purpose. And that eternal purpose was announced from the lips of Jesus himself. And Peter missed it. Can that happen to disciples? 
only while they're al only while they're living. In fact, Later, Peter would even deny three times that he knew Christ. And this during our Savior's darkest hour. Do you understand the implications of that sin? Peter stood on that high mountain and saw the glory of Christ. He saw the glory of Christ. The glorious cloud of God overshadowed them. God spoke to them audibly. And in front of a little girl, she, Peter says, I don't know him. Is that okay? No. But was he one of God's little children? Yes. I did not just say that you can live in rebellion all of your days and think of yourself as a Christian. Peter didn't go on denying the Lord Jesus Christ. But God's children can deeply and horrifyingly sin. I mean, let's stop and think about it just a little later on. After, G after Peter has been restored, Christ has come to him following the resurrection and restored him. And, and, and what happens a little later on? He would cower before the Jerusalem Jews and deny the gospel by stopping his practice of eating with the Gentiles. That was bad doctrine. You know how bad it was? Paul the Apostle publicly rebuked him. Paul didn't say, that's it. I knew you were a traitor. I knew you didn't have it in you. I knew the root of the matter wasn't in you. He rebuked him because he loved him. And he was restored. He didn't despise God's little child. This same man would eventually write, As he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. The word conversation there means lifestyle behavior in every aspect of your life make sure you're holy the denier of Christ rebuked as Satan the one who lost it publicly so much so that Paul had to rebuke him God's little children can err greatly the issue is not that you err the issue is what you do when you do, when you err. But even then, we must not put our personal clock on when they repent. People say to me, do you think so-and-so is really a Christian? And I say, I don't know. Well, do you think the Lord will restore him? I don't know. Well, what do you think? I think right now he's not living like a Christian. Now the Lord knows the rest. And I will tell him the truth and I will be faithful to his soul. If he's the Lord's, the Lord will reclaim him. But the, the Bible doesn't give, her, give us a time stamp. We can conclude 
so-and-so loves the world and is living like an unbeliever. I can't tell you what he is. I can tell you he's living like an unbeliever. And I have no reason to believe that he's one of God's children, but I will not despise him. I will pray for God's mercy on his immortal soul. Because Christ gave the parable, he'll go into the mountains looking for that one lost sheep. Is it not remarkable that Jesus did not always reveal the same things to his very disciples at the same time? Wake up. Does that not tell you something? If you know anything at all from Christ, it's pure grace. And if you know it, don't be proud about it. Because Christ gave it to you. Peter plainly understood that Jesus was Christ by the revelation of God the Father. And Jesus Christ noted that. But the vast and teeming multitudes of Israel did not. They remained in their darkness. Jesus revealed his glory to Peter, to James, and to John, but not the other nine. Now, if you think you know something, not just you read a book or you took out a concordance and read ten verses on a particular subject, that doesn't make you an expert on the subject. You might have learned a lot more. Praise the Lord, that's what you should be doing. Don't misunderstand me. Take your concordance out and look up every passage you, that you can find. Take out your topical Bible as well so that you find out that all kinds of verses have to do with certain doctrines that never have the Word in them. Most important verse in the Old Testament about justification by faith. is Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. That's justification by faith. The word justification doesn't appear there. It's a big book. And just because a word that you're looking for may be in some verses, there may be 20 verses that don't contain the word that when you put them together, bring you to a different understanding. <coughs> study. Study well. Study, but know how to study. And don't let your pride get away with you. You might be able to sit at the lunch table and talk to people who haven't taken out their Bibles and haven't taken their, their, their concordances out and sit and have the spotlight the whole time telling them stuff that they don't know. And you could be dead wrong about some of it or all of it. Be humble. But then does, does this connect? Are, are, you, are you getting this? Christ has told us not to despise his little ones. And this is one of the ways we do it the most intensely, the most frequently, and sometimes with the most unchristian attitudes. All the time thinking we're the righteous one. I wish I could tell you I didn't know this by experience. I wish I could say, well, I've never done that, but you know, some of you have. Well, no, I know, I know what it's like to read a few books and know what everybody at the table doesn't. So what? If it's not spoken for edification, you're just preening your peacock feathers. And despising those that don't know as much as you. Someone might have the temerity to, just, to disagree with you and you can throw three Proof text, Adam, that means nothing. You've got to look at this book and look at it carefully and look at it intensely and ask yourself and ask yourself again, praying, pleading with the Lord for light, asking Him to guide you. Not all of God's people will come to the same understanding at the same time. So number three, what do we learn from this? 
first and foremost, we must be humble. This is the first lesson that Jesus taught in this discourse about the relationships of his people in his kingdom. And that includes us in this congregation and all of Christ's congregation. Humility first. Humility is that foundation for all of these relationships. We must be teachable like a little child. We must learn that all of God's people do not understand the same things at the same time. And I want to be clear. I don't want to be misunderstood on this. If you're drifting, either go on to sleep and get the DVD later or make sure you're awake and listening with discernment in the way that this is offered. I am not saying that every professing Christian, excuse me, I'm not saying that everything professing Christians believe or practice is acceptable. I'm not saying that. I'm not giving a pass to everybody. You say, well, well this is what I believe. Good, I'm glad that you believe something, but now make sure it's what the Word of God teaches. And that's not always as easy as we think. I am saying that we must be humble, patient, teachable regarding those who disagree with us on some doctrines and some aspects of the Christian life. That directly rises from this passage. Don't look down on Christ's little children. Do we look down on? Get honest with yourself. Don't be thinking about somebody else sitting in here. Let's get to you. I have to look at me. Do we write off and treat as worthless people when they cross our pet doctrine? Do we consider them worthless when they disagree with us about something important but secondary. Caution. Footnote. When I say important but secondary, I'm not demeaning any truth in God's Word. All truth in the Word of God is important because it's God's truth. But some truths in this book directly relate to our salvation and others do not. Now, just to make sure you're with me, I'm not saying then it's okay to be sloppy in what you know. I'm certainly not saying that it's okay well, to have, well, my view without listening to some degree to the other view. I'm not saying that's okay. <clears throat> what I'm saying is that you've got to be a good listener and you also have to have some sense that God has actually taught you something. I've got a house full of books. I can talk about a lot of subjects. Over the years I've discovered I don't agree with some of the things I used to think. We grow. We don't understand everything at once. And the tragedy is that very often we really think we do and we're fired up and we run over people just like a, a tank. And then find out a little bit later, hmm, maybe I didn't have that completely down. Where did it come from? Listen, pride. Pride, your pride. Jesus begins this lesson with humility. Let's, let's, let's just talk about some secondary matters. 
Some, hear that? Not an exhaustive list. Some, yes, this is the sermon of qualifications. I want to be heard because this is an important command from Christ. Dating versus courtship. Does that matter? I think it matters a lot. Homeschooling versus public schooling. Head coverings versus no head coverings. Sunday school versus no Sunday school. Television versus no television. Roman Catholic holidays versus no Roman Catholic holidays. A-mill, post-mill, pre-mill versus each other. Ecclesiastical text or Alexandrian text. Male headship versus egalitarianism. Infant sprinkling versus believer immersion. Covenant theology versus dispensational theology. Got them both here. Pants versus skirts and dresses. Wine versus grape juice in the Lord's Supper. Lord's Day versus no Lord's Day. The Ten Commandments versus some Old Testament commandments or no commandments of the Decalogue in the life of the believer. Etc. 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 It makes you mentally weary. Knowing any of these in and of itself, listen carefully, will not save you. You must believe the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. But that's why I'm saying to you, every single one of these matters that I just read is important. But it is secondary. It is important. Listen Carefully, I'm not saying that what you believe about these things and what you practice in the light of them are not important. They are important. When, when people say things like, you know, well, this is secondary, in our minds, our natural thing is to click off and say, not important. I'm telling you, every one of these is important. Every one of them. Now, here's the deal. You need to be ready to give account to God for what you think about each one of them. And it better come from here. And, and that, that is the, 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 the proverbial tip of the iceberg. There are so many things to wrestle through. There are so many things to know in this book. Did anyone hear me say it's okay, whatever version of this you take? I did not say it. I do not mean it. Every one of these things and many, many more, you better know what God wants you to know about them. Oh, I just have my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't fool with all that doctrinal stuff. Well, God commands you to. Why do you think you can blow it off? It's his truth. He wants you to live in his truth. Well, I got the doctrines of grace. Not enough. Not enough. This is a big book. It's a big life. And a lot of us are not tuned in to that fact. We get a few things down and we're the big fish in the little pond. But it's from that posture that we look down on God's little children. Friend, this is serious. I'm not giving a pass to any doctrine that you or I might conclude is false. I'm just saying, if they don't know it, God hasn't shown them. Or they haven't studied and tried to find out. 
Remember that Peter got it right one second. You're the Christ. The next, sen- the next moment, he's Satan. Brethren, how we deal with God's children is what we're talking about. I'm not talking about how we resolve all of these verses, verses, verses against. I'm saying, how do you treat God's children in light of them and where you come down? You can disagree firmly with somebody, and I mean not budge an inch, and love them as God's little children. I would say that some of the things that I mentioned are extremely important for God's worship. What's more important than that? Some of these are important for the daily life, just the daily getting by of the Christian life. They're important. But we are saved by repenting of our sins and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, do these things decide our salvation? No. Could one's position on these things indicate that he or she is not a regenerate soul? Sometimes, yes. But that's not where we start. And many of us have our little list of where we start. And it's not always God's mind. God will make these things abundantly clear in the day of judgment. He's told us how to live, and we must do the best that we can. Do we immediately write off those who are opposite to our position? Well, I have to leave that in your hands. But are you sure you're within the bounds of Christ's command? Do not offend one of these little children. Do not look down on them. Do not consider them Useless or valueless. Because God sent his angels to minister to him. God sent his son to save them. Did I just say doctrine doesn't matter? No. It matters. Now. The question must come down to this. Do you despise God's children for holding opposite of your position on secondary things? I would say, I would suggest we probably all, beginning right here, have a lot of repenting to do about this. Does repenting mean I don't hold what I believe fervently? No. We're not talking right now about the content of your belief, but how you're holding your belief causes you to treat God's children. That's the point. Keep on struggling for these truths. We're commanded in Scripture. And I don't have time to follow all of this out. I would love to. It's another sermon all in itself. We are commanded to be like-minded Therefore, what we ought to be thinking is, well, this is what I think, and I don't care what anybody says. And we tell you, there are lots of Christians with that idea, with that kind of attitude. The idea is, am I giving myself to know and understand the truth well enough that I can even disagree with this person? Do I understand the truth enough to disagree? And if I disagree, how can I treat them? How should I treat them? That's what we're about. In God's kingdom, there's no place for king on the hill. We're commanded to like-mindedness. Everyone here that says he's a Christian should say, my purpose is to be like-minded with the folk at that congregation of which I'm a part. Is that clear? It isn't American democracy. It's Jesus' kingdom. It's his blood-bought people, their blood-bought consciences. 
We can inform, we can talk, we can even get a little hot sometimes, as long as we rein it in. But we need to realize how we treat God's children is what we're going to give account for. Yes, false doctrine needs to be rejected, and we need to do that to the best of our ability. But some of our other brethren may not hold what we hold. I say again emphatically, these things are important. And you must, you must, you must be ready to give account to God for what you think about these things and many others. By the way, for those of you that just like to say, oh, well. There's a very popular song shortly after the Lord had converted Myra and me. We heard it just about everywhere we went. But it's, let's just praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord. And, and, and behind that thought was, oh, let's stop fussing about doctrine. Let's not worry about doctrine. Let's just praise the Lord. You have no Lord to praise without his doctrine. Is it important? Yes. Am I saying back off? Don't worry about any you know, doctrine. Don't just, don't just agree. Just, uh, no. I am saying how we handle what we know is crucial to God. Trust you understand why this is the majority of this message. And I'm hap quite happy to think that this may be three parts. Because this has to be, this has to be understood and lived in. We should be striving for the unity that Christ wants us to have. But it's got to be his way. It's got to be his way. I'm saying to you, be Berean. You might say, well, I believe this because, and your favorite teacher pops up. You toss your name of your favorite teacher in there. Great. He might be wrong. Some here appreciate Dr. John MacArthur. Right? In his early days, he rejected the doctrine of the eternal sonship of Christ. Those listening to him at that time got bad doctrine and he publicly has renounced his former teaching but that happens to God's people at one time he preached fervently against particular redemption definite atonement some might call it limited atonement he has publicly said, I was wrong, and he now teaches it. Listen, just because you have a favorite preacher doesn't mean he knows much of anything. You've got to be Berean. Oh, I like his style. Well, he, I don't care. <laughs> Is he delivering the truth? And do you know it to be the truth? Are you looking in the scriptures? It's not just because, oh, my favorite guy says this. Listen, we may disagree so intensely about some things, and this happens. It's life. I, I wish it weren't that way. I wish this never happened among God's people. But it happens. And the differences can be so intense that sometimes we have to worship in different congregations. Sometimes even different denominations. But you need to make sure that that conclusion comes from careful study and prayer and being humble and listening and making sure you're getting what's being said. I urge all of you to read our confession and read the appendix which talks about baptism and listen to our doctrinal forebears. 
about how they viewed those that disagreed with them on that important subject. Read it carefully. Listen. Even bosom friends and fellow workers in the gospel can separate. Paul and Barnabas. Listen, these guys loved each other. They loved each other. They went to the mat for the gospel together. These men put their necks on the chopping block, so to speak. They extended their lives ready to die any moment together for the Lord Jesus Christ. And what happened? John Mark had abandoned Paul and Barnabas in Pamphylia. Barnabas, who loved men's souls, was determined to take him. We need to bring John Mark. We can teach him something. Paul disagreed. Mm -mm. He abandoned us. Can't trust him. No. Now, I don't know what they talked about. I don't know what their arguments were. But here's what the Holy Spirit tells us. The contention between them was so bad, they went different directions. They were brothers. But this is at least apparently the first church split that we have in, in, in the scriptures. Maybe we shouldn't say it that way. Maybe it's just the first big split between fellow workers. But the contention was so sharp, says the Holy Spirit, that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed him to Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed. Does that happen? I wish it didn't, but it does. And both of these men were convinced they were right. Are, are, is anyone here ready to say one was lost and a reprobate and an apostate? Or that one of them was wrong? Can you be wrong and be a Christian? What, is this, what does this text tell you? Somebody's wrong here. And the Holy Spirit doesn't tell us. You know, if we worked at it, we could have a church split on the Barnabas group or the Paul group. If we worked at it really hard, no, Paul was right. We're going to go with Paul. No, Barnabas, he was the loving one. He took John Mark. Couldn't we? It happens. But it shouldn't. So, brethren, in this context... It's vital that we understand even the finest of Christian men sometimes part, and it doesn't mean one of them is an apostate. It doesn't mean necessarily that one of them is so wrong, ah, he proved it, he's not even a Christian. They genuinely came down and did not see this situation the same way, and it caused them, dear friends, to split. I don't like that. But that's the way it works. I mean, I could have thrown a lot of other things into the list. Divorce, remarriage. There's so many things that God's people are bickering out there today. And the amazing thing is what happens when one of the groups starts to feel their muscle a little bit. And the next thing you know, they've got them a movement. And everybody that doesn't get on board with their movement is probably apostate. Do you not see... Do we not see the hand of the enemy here? No, we want to jump in and take sides. Maybe there are times when we need to back up and say, sorry, I don't have a dog in this fight right now. When it comes to your church, you got a dog in the fight. You got you to work with it. But brethren, we could just keep going on. I'm saying to you, Jesus has said, don't despise my little ones. That means we have to find ways to work these kind of things out. And you know where it begins? With humility. Be like a teachable, vulnerable child. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. We're generally not like that. Let me press just a little further and we'll stop for today. I thought we'd get a lot further. 
But this, this, is, this is the one. The Lord takes us all this week. We sure need to get a hold of this and live in it. You might say, well, how do we handle this? What do we do? I'm not talking compromise. So do we get that right out of the chute? One, you humble yourself before the Lord. You humble yourself before the Lord. Number two, be teachable and discerning. Don't make any fast decisions on what you're hearing. Some men are slick talkers and they can out talk somebody else and make him look like a clown when the clown is right. That is a fact. Why do you think there's so many cults out there? Number three, pray earnestly, pray earnestly, pray earnestly that God will teach you his way. There was a young man here in the congregation that had problems. I knew it, but when he was here, he always put a face on that fooled many in the congregation. But the spiritually minded began to pick up with just a few discussions with him that he had problems. If you're not filling your mind and heart with the Word of God, filling your, I don't mean an occasional reading of Psalm 23. If you are not filling, I love the Psalm, by the way. What I'm saying is that if you, if you are not familiarizing yourself with the Scripture and what to learn biblically to read in someone, you will have no discernment. And you won't be able to pick up often when someone is Selling you a bridge in Brooklyn. I see it all the time. How is it that Christians can be taken so easily? Well, first of all, it's because we want to help people. And wolves know that. Number two, this is the bad side of it. It's because we're often so ignorant of God's word. And if someone comes on with the right power and the right, he looks right, we'll vote for him. No. No. We need to make sure what we're hearing is the Word of God. I said, pray earnestly that God will teach you His way, His truth. Number four, be ready to die to yourself when He shows you the truth. It may not be what you want to hear at first. All that weird stuff that the pastor was talking about. I don't know about that. Well, stay in this book and keep reading. I've had people call me over the years or email me and say, you know, I used to think you were crazy. Or I used to think that you did this or you did that or you believed this or you were that. You know what? I see it now. And probably every one of us has an experience like that. We've told somebody something. They didn't hear it. Nah. And maybe a few years later, maybe a few minutes later, maybe a couple of decades later, I had a man call me after decades and say, you know, you used to tell me how important the local church was. And I thought that was totally wrong. I thought you didn't know what you were talking about. I've come to realize it's the most important thing in my life. This is what Christ has given me in order to grow. It wasn't because I was right. It's because it's what the Word of God teaches. It's His body. He wants you to grow up. He wants you to mature. He doesn't want you to walk around like spiritual babies in diapers all the time. Number five. Hold on firmly to what you believe Christ has taught you. I'm not saying give up anything right now. I'm saying, how do you act toward those who disagree? I'm not saying give up a single thing you believe unless you're convinced by Scripture that it is indeed the Word of God. At that point, go back to number four. Be ready to die. Be ready to die to yourself 
when the Lord shows you the truth. Instead of your pride going, I got to find a way to make sure that this looks like I knew what I was talking about back then. Mm -mm. Just go, wrong, I was wrong. Brethren, God loves his little children. He has loved them since before he created the world and the universe. He loves them so that he sends his own angels to minister to them. I mean, if, if everywhere you went, you had a huge bodyguard, would you feel a little more confident? Well, brethren, you have something greater than that in the angels that God gives to his people. He preserves our lives. Secondly, what you need to understand about that love is that he gave his son for those little ones. They're going to make some huge mistakes. God's people do. They do. They err. They sin. But he loves them and he gave his son for them. And he's not interested in you downing them. And we'll take this up in greater detail next week. God willing. But now understand as we close. If you're, if you're convinced that the Lord has taught you something from this book, praise and thank your God. Hold on to it for dear life and walk in it the best of your ability. Should along the way you begin to realize maybe you didn't have something quite right, repent and walk in the light, the further light that the Lord has given you. Both of your pastors have had to do that. And we're still expecting perhaps some more to come. But I would say go back to this passage and read it again and again and again and see how Jesus made the case for not despising one of these little ones that believed in him. Humility is where it begins. Humility is how it continues. And humility is how it ends. And may we grow up into Christ, learning not to despise his children. Amen. There's a faulty vessel here speaking, Lord. But I pray that thy word and thy truth has been clear this morning. Please bless thy children. Help us to love one another as hard as that is to do sometimes. Help us not to be sloppy in what we believe. Help us not simply to pick up what someone else teaches because it fits the way we want to live. Father, Help us to be people of the word and people of prayer. Help us to love thy gospel and help us to examine what we think, what we do by the word. Help us to listen to good preaching, good teaching. Father, we can listen to the scriptures all day long. It's in every audible form available to media today. There's more preaching available than ever. But what fruit are we seeing? Oh God, make us real Christians who are humble, who do not cause thy children to stumble, and who do not look down on them. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together. of God and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love 
one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Amen.